Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia without a greenhouse or grow lights or humidifiers, just me and them indoors or outdoors or not at all. So plant lovers, if that sounds like your kettle of fish, do hit subscribe so that you too can follow my amateur and rambling adventures about what works for me and what doesn't. And that's kind of the point. Some things do and some things don't. It depends entirely on where you are and what your conditions are. But it's always useful to try and find out information. And I found it very difficult to try and find hints about what I could grow. So here we are. A channel was born. And this channel is stimulated, obviously, by buying new orchids occasionally. Um, I must confess, I have made a video about going to an orchid group sale, which was amazing. And I said in that video that I bought 14 orchids. Plant lovers, I misinformed you. I bought 15. But I wanted to save this one because it was in bloom. And I don't normally buy blooming flowers because I just think, ah, oh, it's a bit of a cheap way out. But look at that. And this, this is that sort of dancing ladyish type of Oncidium, although this isn't, but there's a story. Uh, I have just not been able to get any of these to bloom. So I bought one in bloom and it is Gomesa flexuosa. And Gomesa, one of those types that oscillates between Oncidium and Gomesa. And according to Q, it is still a Gomesa, but the Oncidium is a synonym of it. So we can accept both. But I like the name Gomesia because it's named after a Portuguese, well, sort of Renaissance man, really, Dr. Bernardino Antonio Gomez. And he was Portuguese, late 18th, early 19th century. His son uh, was also a famous scientist. In fact, his son was the first person to use anaesthetic in Portugal. There you go. But Daddy Gomez um, gave his name to this uh, group of orchids and they were named interestingly by Robert Brown who was a Scottish botanist in the late 18th early 19th century and in fact he came to Australia in the very early 19th century in some of those early expeditions and he named a lot of Australian plants so there you go he also went to Brazil and named some Brazilian plants anyway ramble 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 here we are and this is one of those types of flowers that is incredibly common been hybridized and you see them all over the place very, very beautiful, called Dancing Ladies Orchids for a very good reason. Just the prettiest things. But yeah, I've got a few of the um, hybrids sort of generated from this type of flower. Dancing Lady Oncidiums. And yeah, I can get any Oncidium to bloom, but not those. Anyway, the other one that I have loves being eaten by insects and caterpillars because <laughs> it's outside. Um, now, but the thing about this one, Gomeza, is just its growth habit. Now I'm going to lift it up and it becomes quite dull. As you can see, incredibly long flower spike. But look at that growth habit. It's a real rambler. Isn't that amazing? Now, I have to make sure I don't hit the ceiling with the flower. I found a couple of images of this growing uh, in its native habitat. And this is pretty common throughout much of Brazil. And it's a real clinger. So when people describe orchids as epiphytes, there are epiphytes and there are epiphytes and there are epiphytes. This is one of those things that clings to the bark on the side of a tree. So there's no medium whatsoever. A bit like a Phalaenopsis, for example, does a similar thing. So as you can see, it's almost like some of those amazing philodendrons. It clings to the side of the tree and will grow up and the arching flower spike gets the flowers out into the light where it will obviously bloom, but also attract pollinators as they waft in the breeze and look like a yellowy gold insect and attract those pollinators. But it's that growing habit that's quite interesting. So you can see all of the aerial roots here, which are gonna help the, the orchid cling to the bark of the tree that it's growing up. But plant lovers, of course, therein lies the problem, because for those of us who aren't that passionate about mounting orchids for various reasons, I can't have mounted orchids inside because obviously they'll drip on the carpet. There's nowhere for me to grow them. So if I'm going to mount something, it's got to be outside all year. And this this can take cool temperatures. So we're going to have to see. But what I think I'm going to do is you can get orchid baskets which attach to a piece of timber which you can buy from hardware stores so what i think i'm going to do is get one of those baskets but actually replace the timber with a much longer piece so that this orchid is going to have the room to grow and sort of support itself up the back or even just a pole a log 
Anyway, quite tricky, isn't it? But there you are. So I am going to have to find my own magic way to grow that beautiful orchid. Uh, it is early autumn here in Australia and this flower is on its way out, as you can see. So the season for the blooming is just about over. So the interesting thing is, and I'll come and show you, is that the flower's spike is generated from the base of the pseudobulb here, which in a normal oncidium it would be, except that the pseudobulb is so elevated because it's got this rambly habit. Um, so the interesting thing would be if it's going to bloom multiply from an old uh, pseudobulb or whether it will only bloom from each new pseudobulb as the plant gets bigger and climbs further up the tree. Probably, I don't know, I haven't seen this one do its thing before. Uh, so we will watch this space and see what happens but this is quite a mature pseudobulb that has produced the bloom whereas this is a newer pseudobulb as is this one here. So these two are quite new so hopefully next season they'll be blooming. And just to demonstrate the point, here is that Oncidium hybrid. Now, this one is called Sweet Sugar. <sighs> now, I've got to explain why it looks so terrible, because actually it isn't that unhealthy, but anyway. But two of the ancestor parents of this one are two species orchids that I have. So one of them is Gomesa flexuosa, which we are looking at. So you can actually see, can you see here that this is beginning to get kind of similar creepy habits to um, to part of its species ancestry anyway. Now the other, um, one of the many, because this, this is a very complex beast, but one of the other species ancestors is Oncidium spasolatum, which is one I also have, I've made a video about, and that's the one I was talking about that's quite cold tolerant and has very, very, very long spikes with much larger flowers. Um, so there are six species ancestors involved in this. Anyway, so what you can see is what looks like a very moth-eaten plant. And in fact, it is. So all of this damage here is on last year's leaves and I keep this outside all year. Now, the problem was that I just hadn't noticed that it was covered in little caterpillars and they stripped the leaves, as you can see. Uh, so that was last year's growth. So then over this winter, I decided, right, I'm going to change it up. I'm going to bring it inside this winter. So it's been outside undercover for the last two or three years. Large plant. It was one of those tiny little seedlings in a plastic slip from a hardware store for sort of $8.95. Uh, so it's grown enormously. Each year it sends out a wonderful array of new growth anyway. So then this year I thought, right, nothing has happened. It's flowering size, something should be happening. So I moved it into a position where it got much stronger light and ta-da, we got burn on the leaves. So there you go, that didn't work. So now I've moved it a little bit further into the space. So it's still bright indirect, you know, classic Oncidium light, um, but it's just not as burny and I am, well, particularly in spring, I was spraying this about once a week with a general chewing insect insecticide because I just did not want it to be munched again. And in fact, all of this year's leaves are quite healthy and green and they haven't been touched by the biting, nibbling, chewing insects, but they were just burnt by the sun. Anyway, Oh, what a palaver, but I'm hopeful <laughs> that we'll get somewhere with this one. So despite all of these setbacks, it still keeps growing vigorously for me. Uh, and I'm, I'm very interested now that we've got Flexuosa to actually see that this plant is starting to mimic some of those habits. So maybe it wasn't flowering size, maybe now it is. And if it's gonna flower in a similar way to its species parent, anyway, we'll see. Um, Spasolatum flowers, Oh, late winter. Uh, so it's be interesting to see which of all of those ancestor species it takes after in terms of when it's going to bloom. So it could realistically be from any point now onwards. But anyway, we shall see. But if this blooms, plant lovers, you will be the first to know. Now, the range of this orchid is basically the east coast. So, um, well, the eastern part of South America, so includes Bolivia, Argentina, Uruguay, up the coast to Brazil, and it can grow to quite high altitudes, so it can take cool temperatures, as can a lot of oncidiums, actually. So 
I am going to try it outside all year if I can figure out this mounting thing. Now the grower has it in obviously a pot with medium sized bark. Uh, so not a bad growing medium for this sort of orchid but I think the thing you're going to have to do is just make sure that this is kept reasonably moist. Obviously I will dial that down in winter but all of these aerial roots and this growth needs to be kept quite moist. It comes from a humid environment where it is growing up the bark of a tree and capturing all of that moisture. Anyway I am going to really have to see how I can manage to grow it but fingers crossed I can make it work. Like most oncidiums, it's going to take bright indirect light, not too bright, but reasonably bright indirect light. Um, not enough light, they won't bloom. Too much light, you're really going to start affecting the leaves negatively. But looking at images of this growing in the wild is actually quite free forest, if you know what I mean. So it's not very dense. There's lots of dappled light penetration. So yeah, more light than not for this baby. I have another species on Cidium, which I have made a video about, which I will link. That again blooms for me once a year. Uh, it's a much larger flower, but very similar color palette to this one. And that can take seriously cold temperatures. And it's a very vigorous grower, um, but flowers once a year. So I'm presuming that this, as it's a species, is only gonna flower once a year as well. Hybrid Oncidiums have been hybridized to emphasize many characteristics and traits, but one of them being multiple blooming. Uh, but generally the species that you find only bloom once a year, but usually quite long lasting. Food wise, much the same as anything, give it liquid food or a slow release fertilizer during its growing season and I will always dial it down in winter. However, hybrid oncidiums can have growth cycles throughout the year. They don't really have an off period. So you just need to feed and water the plant whenever it needs it really when it's doing something generally they go into a bit of a stasis after they've bloomed and sort of pause for a second you might want to dial watering down a bit then but then you should see new growth so then of course you up your ante again however generally in winter i always dial it down so even if it is in a growth cycle you wouldn't water it as much as you would in midsummer when it's obviously going to evaporate and the ambient temperature will uh, drain out a lot of that moisture. So in winter, regardless, just dial it down a bit. Well, there we are, Dancing Lady. I am very, very pleased and I had nothing to do with this bloom, but I'm showing it to you because it's so pretty and I failed. Well, I failed. I just haven't got mine to bloom yet. It's a hybrid, so <laughs> we'll see. I've moved it to somewhere. I keep moving it. I keep trying a different position because this is the thing. If it's not doing what you want it to do, in a particular position, nothing's really going to change unless something changes, which is a philosophical mantra. So I've moved its position. It's now getting very different sort of light. So we'll see if I can coax that into bloom. If I do, you'll be the first to know. But anyway, from this beauty, which I also got at the orchid sale, and I should tell you how much it was. It was 30 Australian dollars. There we are. That's the price tag there, uh, which for a flowering specimen plant is not a bad price, is it? The other thing is, it's just hard to find um, orchids for sale in Australia anymore. There are fewer and fewer specialist growers, particularly in the southern states down here. The further up the coast you go into New South Wales and Queensland and the tropical parts of the country, there are more growers, but less down here, less cool growers. Um, maybe in my dotage, I'm going to have to open uh, an orchid nursery here in Melbourne and sell beautiful flowering specimen orchids. Who knows? Perhaps. Uh, never say never. But anyway, uh, orchid groups are one of the best places to buy flowering and unusual specimen orchids. So there we are, plant lovers, from Gomesa flexuosa. And flexuosa in Latin means um, bending and turning. So it's really about the, uh, the nature of the flower spike in terms of how the, well, generally it refers to flower spike. I suppose it could, of course, refer to the growth habit of the plant because it's going all over the place. Anyway, there we are. Uh, so from Gomesa, Flexurosa and myself, thank you very much for finding me. I do post every week on a Friday, so hit subscribe if you want to know what my adventure might be next week. But until then, plant lovers, I look forward very much to seeing you. Take care wherever you are in your orchid world and I'll see you next week.